the, tra- the Judge Gupta and his home, so should okay. be good. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave uh, President Paul to jump in to make a good, good introduction for, for the day, and then I will go on with my presentations. Yeah, so uh, for today's uh, lectures, we're going to present about how to apply the techniques into actual control proceedings. So for the day one, it was more to how to get the data from the biosignals, and we will apply those signals into the process of control. And there's various ways to um, do that, uh, including interfacing methods and control strategies. And we'll be starting from how we can be in more depth about the physiological side you know, and to create the modeling about the musculoskeletal model. And then we'll go a little bit more like uh, uh, take away uh, to see the whole picture about the like, uh, traditional uh, control strategies and into more multilinear control strategies. Uh, so today uh, I'll start uh, the day with uh, this talk, so from intent to function with inverse and forward neuromusculoskeletal simulations. Uh, so I'm Arnaud Kaye, I graduated a few months ago. I'm very lucky to have my PhD examiner in the room, uh, Adam Adesh. Uh, and I'll move forward. So when I say intent and function, I want to uh, talk broadly. Intent, I want to talk about voluntary muscle contraction, especially in humans. And function is more uh, muscle contraction, joint talks, uh, enabling motion, or uh, joint uh, stabilization, etc. So here it's a simple diagram showing, for example, three muscles, how it would work. Uh, the enormous edge goes um, to the muscle that contracts. Produce, uh, produces forces, uh, creates, uh, transmits the forces to the tendon that would uh, create a joint torque uh, because of the moment arm, and all those joint torques will sum to uh, create a total joint torque that either um, enables motion, lead motion, or again stabilizing the joint. So the aim for this talk is linking neuroscience and biomechanics. Uh, in order to model the interface between intent and function. So what I've seen so far in the PSG uh, is mainly researchers being very good at biomechanics and musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal systems, and other researchers being very good at uh, neuroscience on the physiological side of things, but also modeling uh, the motor neuron behavior, for example. But actually, quite uh, only few researchers and teams trying to bridge the gap between these two fields. Uh, and basically, this interface is quite a weak point uh, right now in the, in the research field. And so things must be done uh, on, this, on this interface. So today, I would like to uh, draw the outline of the, uh, some of, the, of these techniques that try to bridge this gap between neuroscience and biomechanics. Um, and so to link function and intent. So I will start by going backwards. So you have someone moving, uh, having motion, and how can we go back to actual motor control? And then once uh, this is done, I will go forward on the on the second uh, on the second place. Uh, so going from EMGs, so intent to actual muscle forces, joint talks, and uh, lean motion. And in that case, I will review the state of the art and the current practices using bipolar EMG driven uh, models. And then I will go in depth uh, with high density uh, EMG driven uh, simulation pipelines. So a quick uh, recap on muscle physiology, it will be very quick. So a muscle is a multi scale structure. Uh, you have motor neurons that um, innovates packages of um, muscle fibers. The neuron and the fibers uh, they innovate are called motor units. Three uh, motor units are represented here in purple, red, and green. And these action potentials are going to, in each of the myofibrils of each of the fibers of the motor units, will trigger some calcium release in the sarcomeres. The calcium ions here in uh, in red, these are the uh, red dots here, will flow into the sarcomeres, create a conform- conformational uh, change in the sarcomeres that will basically create some cross bridges between the 
myosin and actin filaments, and those sarcomeres uh, will shorten because of that. So each action potential will uh, basically create a shortening of the sarcomeres. And this shortening is going to pro propagate into the multi-scale architecture of the muscle, and the whole muscle is going to contract, and this contraction is at the basis of uh, muscle force. This muscle contracts, transmits passively the force to the tendon, which passively transmits the force to uh, the skeleton neck. So, to link intent and function uh, by just experimental observations is doable. Uh, for example, there are a few studies that combine uh, EMGs, ultrasounds, and dynamometers. For example, you would have uh, transparent uh, grids of EMGs, ultrasound on top, and recording the talk at the same time, uh, so that you can have an idea of an insight on, for example, the firing activity of the motor neurons, but also the geometrical architecture and its change of the, um, for example, the muscle, the muscle fascicle and uh, sarcomeres, and at the same time you have the external measurement of the joint torque, for example. So these uh, exist, but there are highly uh, challenging uh, setups that only a few labs in the world are doing right now, and even though they provide some enormous insights uh, into the actual physiology of muscle contraction. They remain, of course, a bit limited because you can only focus on a specific aspect of the muscle. You can only target a few muscles because, as you can see here, the uh, setup is quite complicated. And so even though they are really useful and uh, very important, they are quite limited. So one way to go forward is to support these experimental observations with computational modeling. So here uh, you can see three different ways of doing musculoskeletal uh, models. So musculoskeletal model is quite simple. It's a model that includes a skeleton and muscles. So you can go with uh, simple models, for example, 2D models with only um, uh, one rigid body or two rigid bodies and then uh, a few uh, muscle models. So these, uh, of course, do not perfectly uh, represent the human body, but they are very useful if you want, for, for example, to get an, an simple an analytical solutions, uh, do, quick, um, uh, do quick trials, or even test very difficult uh, models with simple architectures. But then you may want to go one step uh, more precise with uh, musculoskeletal models that are more representative of the human body. So, for example, this one is taken from the OpenSIM pipeline, and this one from the uh, Anybody pipeline. So, this time we want to represent the, uh, uh, the skeleton of the human body and also um, the muscle actuators uh, that are all represented are as straight lines between insertion and uh, termination points. And then you may want to go again one step further by having this time. Uh, volumetric representations of uh, muscles. So these are, okay, it's not 2006, it's 2020, sorry. Uh, so these are techniques that have been developed for more than 20 years, but which are now quite uh, available in uh, open source pipelines, like, including, first of all, OpenSIM. So these are pretty useful, for example, if you want to do uh, finite element analysis um, uh, investigations or just to have um, uh, physiological representations of the human body and musculoskeletal uh, uh, models. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it the first time, is it the long time first to go actually consider the body of the muscle? Uh, no. Um, so there are papers from the 1990s uh, who already proposed some volumetric representations of muscles in uh, uh, computational pipelines. Yeah. But Luca has provided in 2020 an open source and uh, automatic uh, okay. tool. Basically, you uh, get MRIs from a subject, you do segments, and just based on the STM5s of the segmented muscles, you input that into the um, uh, on the on the MATLAB package that he created with the, the paper, he he was working with a cohort, and it uh, 
directly maps uh, a volumetric muscles uh, composed as uh, multiple fibers onto an open swing skeleton. Yeah, there is. So, uh, yeah, just to go back. So, as you can see in these models, you have the architecture of the musculoskeletal system, but you want muscles to act actually produce force. So, to have actuators here that produce physiological forces, you can use computational models of muscles. So, the aim is taking some neural control and transform it into a muscle force. So you have three main types of uh, muscle models, twitch type models, which is just um, uh, muscle twitches that will uh, non-linearly sum to give the whole muscle force. Then you have more complex uh, models, which are the heel type models. Uh, these ones basically transform the neural control into a muscle activation, which is basically um, a, uh, a metric from zero to one of how much the muscle is activated. And then this is coupled with some contracted properties of the muscles and then the passive structures of the muscle, for example, the tendon here, which is uh, a nonlinear spring. And then you can go one step more complicated again with the Huxley type um, models. So just to go back on this one, this one is basically a phenomenological model. It's a black box uh, representing the macroscopic properties of the muscle. This one goes really in details at the microscopic uh, level, and it models the individual uh, behavior of the sarcomeres. So in this presentation today, I will mainly focus on this type of musculoskeletal model and this type of muscle model. First, because they are the ones uh, that are the most widely used in the field. And also because these are the ones I know uh, about. So I feel a bit more comfortable talking about talking more with those. So I talked uh, a bit about that, but why are we doing some musculoskeletal uh, modeling and simulation? Well, it's basically to do uh, everything that we can't do experimentally. For example, repeat uh, a scenario multiple times. Rather than having a subject coming a thousand times in the in the lab doing the same thing, you will just have a for loop and doing uh, repetitions. Also, very nice, you can do what if studies. Like I have a half party uh, subject, I have a model of this party subject, and if I cut his leg, what happens? Of course, you want to do that on computer. Uh, you can also do kind of what if scenarios, but by probing parameters that may be difficult to measure. Uh, so we can do ultrasound measurements, we can do EMG measurements, but for example, we don't have any ins insights on some, uh, for example, calcium release in the, in the uh, human muscle during contraction. And you can basically play with this parameter with computational simulations by I don't know, minimizing some cost functions and you can play this parameter without measuring it experimentally. So I will start the first phase of uh, this presentation with uh, inverse simulations. So what am I doing on time? Yeah, it's fine. So first I'm moving. I'm moving, okay, I'm moving my arms. What is uh, the, uh, the control strategy to move my arms? Well, if I don't have any insights on the myoelectric activity of the muscles, well, I have to go backwards. What, uh, how can I, can I be moving? So this is uh, a solution to have an insight on, on how, what is my strategy? So I, I start with function, I'm moving my arms and I want to go back to muscle tendon force and muscle control. So I'm going backwards. To investigate that, I will use OpenSIM, which is an open source platform. And I'm especially talking about OpenSIM because it's, this is a tool I like, because it is open source, free, very well document, documented. It has a huge, um, uh, many people are using it. I don't have the word. Uh, yeah, a huge community, it's on the slide. It has a huge community with um, uh, large Q&A, 
uh, forum. So basically, it's very easy to use to get to learn it and uh, to get solutions and troubleshooting. So it's a GUI uh, in which you can run a complex analysis in inverse and forward uh, musculoskeletal simulations. And I will work with that uh, for the next 15 minutes. So who has used OpenSIM before? In the yeah, a few, a few hands here, so wonderful. Ah, that's perfect. So in OpenSIM, what is an MSK model? So it's very simple. It's just a bunch of rigid bodies that will be uh, linked with each other uh, with uh, joints. The joints have one, two, three degrees of freedom. They can be ball joints. Uh, they can be pin joints or uh, linear joints. And uh, these uh, MSK models include forces, so muscle forces or actuators, uh, pure actuators to move the limbs, and also markers. And we'll see uh, what the markers are for. So these MSK models, how can you obtain them? You can build them from scratch. So the technique is uh, conceptually easy. You take a subject, you put the subject in the MRI, you get uh, some uh, images. So slices of MRIs, then you segment the MRIs, slice by slice or with uh, semi-automatic tools, and then you get the volumes. Those volumes, which are STL files, you input them in, uh, for example, automatic uh, tools, for example, stable, or uh, manually using NMS Builder, and you can create those uh, MSK models. What is very nice is that those models will be subject-specific completely in agreement with uh, the more uh, the subject's physiology. But uh, segmenting is a pain. Uh, it takes a lot of time. You need to have uh, an anatomy atlas next to you and it takes uh, at least a day or a few days. So you want you want to go one step quicker and use the re repository of models. <laughs> so this is very nice because there are many, many, many models in the open uh, environment. And I will talk a bit more about that. So now that we know what musculoskeletal models are, I want to focus on this one, the full body model that was released in 2016. This one is a very good one. It has been reviewed for uh, 18 months, if I'm not mistaken. It was basically a massive um, uh, collaboration between bio, uh, researchers in biomechanics. So this paper was first uh, pro uh, proposed, I think, in uh, March 2015, and it was published in July 2016. And uh, through that whole uh, reviewing process, there were, I don't know, maybe 20 biomechanical researchers that would review uh, the model and the paper at the same time to um, provide the best tool possible. So this model has uh, 22 rigid bodies. It's for uh, a generic man, 75 kilos, 170 centimeters. Uh, it has uh, 20 degrees of freedom for the lower body and 17 for the upper body. Uh, the joints are only uh, spherical here, planar here, a bit more complicated, and ankle is just three pin joints for uh, the three uh, articulations, three joints. You have 80 muscle actuators for the 80 uh, key muscles of the lower limb, and for the upper limb, just torque actuators. Uh, and then you have 66 virtual markers that are placed at um, uh, we'll say clever uh, locations of the body, especially the uh, body parts of the body. So this model I would like to show you uh, is this model. And I will, it's just uh, an introductory uh, sh showing of, of this. I will go back to it once we have done the, the analysis. Uh, so yeah, this is the model. You can play around with it. Yeah, it's nice. It has muscles. It has uh, virtual markers, as we said. Nice. So now what should we do with this uh, musculoskeletal model? Uh, remember that the aim is going backwards. We go from motion and we go back to motor control. So the first step, I will not go into details, is scaling. The model is generic. Uh, I'm not 1 meter 70. I'm not 75 kilos. Uh, we need to scale this model to my anthropometry. It can be done on OpenSIM, I will not go into details. Then you want to track some motion that you uh, did in the, in the lab. So for example, someone running, someone uh, walking in the lab, someone climbing stairs, I don't know. 
once you can track the motion and reproduce it with the skeletal structure, you want to compute the joint torques. So from the external forces and body weight, you can compute the joint torques. And once you have everything, you can go back to an estimation of motor control. That is, what are the muscle forces during the task that can create this motion? As you can see, we go backwards from motion to motor control. So going to details, how can we track the motion? I'm in the lab, I have real markers on the, on the body, and I can track those markers with the motion capture system that is just behind you. So we are actually in the mocap room, so it's a uh, hard point. And the aim is to match those markers with the virtual markers of the, of the model here that have been placed before and on the model. And at each time frame, we are just minimizing the distance between the real and the virtual markers. So to do so, I will have to move the limbs uh, of the um, muscul musculoskeletal model. And by moving the limbs, according to the joints that were defined, we are going to reach some good residual error that will put at each time frame the skeleton in the right pose. And in the end, well, you have frame after frame, the skeleton that is moving. Once you have this, you have the position at each time frame, but also the velocity and the acceleration of all the rigid bodies and the joints, the joint angles. And because you know, for example, the mass matrix, but also the external forces, for example, both weight and run reaction forces, well, you apply, you apply the uh, Newton, uh, Newton's laws, and you can immediately compute the joint torques. So this is done automatically in, uh, in OpenSIM. So as long as you have run reaction forces and motion capture, for example, you can get the joint torques. But so far, it's not really what you are interested in. You are interested in intent. You are interested in motor control. And this is the last step of the inverse uh, simulation. So I have someone moving, I can go up to the joint holes. But because I have modeled my uh, muscle architecture at the same time, at each time frame, I also have the moment arm between the muscle tendon system and the joints. I also have the muscle tendon geometry, that is the length of the muscle tendon system at each time frame. And each of, the, of those muscles are modeled with a muscle model that I will go into detail later, but that can estimate the force that all those muscles can produce. And if you put all that together into a minimization function, you can solve the redundancy problem. For example, I do that. I have multiple muscles that are creating the forces and the joint torques to do that. So are these contracting? Are these contracting more? We don't know. It's uh, a redundant problem. You have only one task, only degrees of freedom, and you have multiple muscles. Well, to find a unique solution, you need to use a constraint. And in OpenSIM, the constraint is minim minimizing the <coughs> control. That is to say, minimizing the total activation of the muscles. And once you have done that, basically you have found the minimum level of muscle activation for all the muscles that can create some muscle forces that can create the joint torques that you want, well, you can have an estimation of this muscle control. So this here gives you, at each time frame, a matrix of muscle forces that make it possible for the subject to move like he was moving in the lab. Well, this is very nice, but it has a huge drawback. Well, the minimization function here is on activation. So as you can easily imagine, I'm doing that. The best solution to minimize activation is not having any activation for the antagonistic muscles. So this is a way to have a good insight onto the muscle forces that are created. But for example, it completely puts, um, uh, it completely neg neglects the co-contraction of antagonistic muscles. So this is nice and we'll see that it has some applications, but this will make the red line to why, of course, having EMG-driven informed 
uh, simulations is also very important to uh, decode intents. Well, a recap on inverse uh, simulations. We started from motion. We only have motion and nothing else except ground reaction forces, external forces, and we have all already ways to go back to motor control. This can be this can lead to very nice uh, papers. For example, this paper from Kynes and others in 2018, where basically they did this static optimization phase, so getting the muscle control, to investigate the potential loss of muscle force in children with cerebral, cerebral palsy. So they did this, this full inverse simulation, and then they were playing with uh, the parameters that describes the maximum muscle force. And they were decreasing it step by step until the uh, computation would not converge anymore. That is to say, the muscles were too weak. So this is a potential application. Another application, which is uh, related to today uh, with uh, prosthetics, is, uh, for example, the impact of passive processes on the MSK structure and motion. So I have a healthy, healthy um, subject. I swap a leg, for example, uh, like below knee uh, with a prosthetist to um, uh, simulate a below knee amputee, for example. And I rerun the inverse simulations to see the effect it would have, for example, on muscle activation, muscle forces, and for example, joint contact forces. And this would be already a good step forward to understanding how the prosthetist in its current uh, way, for example, could be bad for other parts of the body. So this is why inverse simulations could be very interesting. And then what we want to do as well today, for example, for controlling processes, is going forward. So this time we are not going from motion back to motor control, but we are going from motor control to motion and to function. So we start this time with EMG, informed uh, uh, data, and we predict the muscle forces and we predict function, so motion, joint torques, et cetera. And here we go. So this is um, EMG-driven heel type models. So who has heard of EMG-driven models uh, before? Yeah, one, two, okay, not a lot again, so that's, uh, that's nice. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you can see, uh, this model that is represented here uh, is used a lot. Uh, I've done a systematic review on that model, more than uh, uh, 3,000 papers using that model. Uh, every year, uh, more than 150. So it's a lot of uh, people using that. And this model comes from this guy uh, who published uh, it in 1921 when he got the Nobel Prize. So this model uh, basically is a black box that simulates the uh, contraction dynamics of a single muscle. So it's represented here, for example, the bicep brachii. Here is this model. And the aim is it's actually a function because it takes as input some bipolar EMGs. It does stuff and the output is muscle force. So in a bit more details, the bipolar EMG is first transformed into a neuromechanical element, uh, into a level of activation, muscle activation. So you have an electric signal that is the bipolar EMG, for example. And then everything that happens, that is calcium release in the fibers, calcium troponin concentration in sarcomeres, uh, cross bridges uh, mechanisms and uh, cross bridges in force generating states, Everything is put together, or all the fibers, all the motor is put together in simple uh, laws, uh, mathematical laws, and put in that blue box, your mechanical element. And that blue box outputs a level, for example, 0 0.3, that says roughly 30% of the sarcomeres in the muscle are in the fourth generating state. So it's a metric. Then you have the contractile elements. The contractile elements says, OK, the muscle has some mechanical properties based on length, traction velocity. It can produce more or less force. The contractile element takes as input uh, the activation state from the new mechanical element 
and then transmits some force to the passive structure, especially the tendon, which is the spring here. And bam, we get the muscle force or the tendon force. So, yeah, actually, I was supposed to say that during that slide. So you have the blue box with activation dynamics, so gives you the activation, then contractile element and passive element, including the tendon. Uh, so if we go in slightly more details, very quickly, the main three things are the activation dynamics, as I said, which goes from EMG to activation level. I'm repeating myself because activation is a key word, so activation level. And then in terms of contractive properties, you have the force length and force velocity relationships. We know about those. Yeah, the, the more I'm going to details, the less hands I see, so it's, it's getting better and better. So the force length relationship is quite simple. Uh, depending on, it, on its length, the muscle can produce more or less force. For example, if I want to lift the table, for example, this would be the optimal length of my muscles. If I go very, very short, I can produce less force because my muscle is too short and the sarcomeres basically don't overlap. Uh, the filaments sarcomeres don't overlap very well. And this is modeled with this curve here. And as you can see, you have a peak. If you are too short, you produce less force isometrically. If you are too long, you produce less force isometrically. <laughs> and then you have the force velocity relationship. If I want to lift something very quickly, I will produce low force. If I uh, lift it slowly, I will produce more force. So here is isometric. Here is shortening quickly. That's why uh, those uh, lift uh, uh, weight lifters uh, basically uh, try to lift things slowly. They, they, they do quick, but basically they start slowly because you produce more force that way. And in uh, muscle modeling, these are the three key things to estimate force. Because in the end, the force is just the product of the three parameters. I have an activation, for example, 30% of activation. I'm at optimal length. So for example, yeah, optimal length. So it's this parameter would be one. Would be one and I'm going slowly, so that parameter would be one. And this is the maximum force the muscle can produce before breaking. So as you can see, it's not that complicated. It's just a product of four terms that uh, really relies on physiological uh, grounds. And then you have the passive elements. So multiple ways to model it. Uh, in short, it's basically the aponeurosis in the muscle. That would be a parallel element. And then you have the tendon, which is an in-series element. Well, now that you have this muscle model, this here is a typical pipeline on how to go from EMGs to muscle force and joint doors. So this here is basically a summary of uh, what I would say 50% of the papers on uh, EMG-driven muscle modeling and simulation would do. So of course they would diverge a bit, but they would rely a lot on this pipeline. So this is uh, a summary of the field, basically. So on the one hand, you have EMG recordings. So usually bipolar, EMG, uh, bipolar EMGs. You get the myoelectric signals from the muscle, which are very noisy and everything, and you filter them, rectify them, refilter them, and normalize them. And you get EMG envelopes. And these EMG envelopes will be one of the inputs to your muscle model, and it's actually the intent of the user. It gives you an insight on what the subject want, the subject wants to do, and uh, how uh, the subject wants to contract his uh, middle muscle. On the other end, uh, so that is one input to the muscle model. The, on the other end, you want to know the architecture of the muscle, because as I said, if the muscle is short or long, and if it is contracting quickly or slowly, it will produce more or less force. So you want to know the state of your muscle, the arch architectural state of your muscle. And to get that, you need a musculoskeletal model. 
So usually what, it, what is done in the field is, again, you have some presumptive home working in the lab. And using the same pipeline as before, using OpenSIM, you are going to make this subject move and get the muscle tendon length. So if I go back a few slides, this was here. You are tracking some motion and you are obtaining those lengths here, but also those moment arms here. And those in the pipeline are also needed here. You get the length and you get the moment arm. So that's nice. I have the myoelectric activity of my muscle that is filtered and basically I have envelopes. On the other side, I have the muscle architecture. Bam, I input that into the muscle model. And the muscle model with that will be able, based on the relationships I showed you just before, uh, is going to be able to uh, predict some muscle forces. One last thing is that this muscle model here is generic for all the muscles. We assume that all the muscles are working the same way, but they're not the same. So you want to scale this model. You want to scale to maximum force or to, for example, ten tendon length. And that's why you have always a few subject-specific, muscle-specific parameters here. Well, I just told in, I would say, five minutes, basically uh, how the field reached that point in uh, 25 years, basically. It has been a step-by-step May I ask you, yeah. like, do you use all three parameters for scaling, or do you choose for one of them and choose the advantage of using one of them? Okay. So, all three parameters are usually very important. Uh, but depends for what. Um, if you are doing a simulation with multiple muscles, for example, the maximum isometric force is very important because you want to give more weight to a large muscle than to a simple muscle. And if you are doing uh, MSK simulations, if you are getting this wrong, you are going to get the whole uh, muscle strategy wrong. Then if you focus on a single muscle, you want to have those two uh, right, the optimal fiber length that will dictate when the muscle is at optimal length or maximum force production. Uh, and the tennis like length is also very important because um, uh, it defines from which point, from which length, the tendon is going to transmit force. So if you get this value, for example, too long, it's going to be slack for a very, very, very long length. And the muscle must uh, shorten, 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 shorten before it starts transmitting force to uh, the skeleton. And uh, if you get a very, very short muscle that is not physiological, it's going to be too short, so to produce too low force compared to what it should be before it starts transmitting force to the, to the skeleton structure. So there have been many um, studies that have uh, investigated the, uh, the sensitivity of the predictions to those parameters. And the rule of thumb is LSD, the tendon slack length, is capable, capable of basically crushing all your results if you get it. Um, there are basically generic muscle-specific values, so not, not subject-specific, but muscle-specific, uh, in the paper from uh, Raja Gopal, 2016, those who created the muscular yeah. model. You have the uh, And then there are multiple ways to uh, scale those muscle specific values to uh, be subject specific as well. Okay, uh, so does it mean in practical that uh, when uh, you want to scale something like this, you give a different weight to L and uh, uh, is this what it means? Yeah. For instance, if you are working with single uh, muscle, yeah. you give a specific weight, and if you are going with multiple muscle, you give a specific weight, or this is done automatically? Uh, I mean, uh, so OpenSIM already has uh, the generic muscle-specific values uh, in, in the model. So what I do usually is that I extract them uh, using the OpenSIM API, and then I scale usually based on, uh, well, it depends on the parameters, but usually based on um, 
muscle tendon lengths between the generic model and the specific model. Um, yeah, so th this is uh, how it is done. So it has evolved. For example, there is uh, this um, uh, work from uh, Sartori and Group, uh, which is also including an online, uh, offline, sorry, calibration of some parameters, uh, which are difficult to measure experimentally. So basically, uh, you have uh, kinematics, you have EMGs as inputs. Um, you input that to the muscle model, you get some muscle forces that are predicted. From the muscle forces, you can go to joint torque just by multiplying with the bigger arms. And what you want to do is compare the predicted joint torques to experimentally measured joint torques. And you put them face to face and you want to minimize the difference. And to minimize the difference, we are going to play on those parameters. So this is an offline calibration that is done with a training set. And then the calibrating model is applied to a test set for the actual validation of the tool. So, um, what is the time? Shall I, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. Okay, I, I will. I was supposed to show you something on MATLAB right now, but I will go forward so that I can show you high density MG, which is a bit more interesting. Um, this is just something that I showed during uh, the summer camp in uh, Bayona last month. Uh, we had the EMG bracelet that uh, Patrick developed, and we are doing just uh, extension and inflection for the wrist. And so what we could do is just having the joint angles here and the EMG recordings here. These EMGs were um, transformed to EMG envelopes for the extensor muscles on the back hand and flexor muscles on the other hand. And here the joint angles were coupled with this musculoskeletal model, the wrist, to get the muscle tendon lengths. And the tutorial was basically, you have this, you have this. Can you please compute those four uh, functions to output the muscle force? And then the student had the movement arms as well. They were multiplying this by this for the 43 muscles, getting the matrix of joint torques for all the muscles. And they were outputting the joint torque, an estimation of the joint torque. And it was very nice because in the end, they were obtaining, okay, I'm extended, well, I have a joint torque in extension, and then I'm flexing and they, they were having positive joint torque inflection. So this pipeline, as soon as you know how to do it, it's very easy to do, basically. Well, May I ask one yeah. Ask one? yeah, sure. So how did you, uh, I guess with the data that you have, then I just said that with distance, so, so you actually don't know which muscle they are. How do you take this and you account it? Okay, so that because it was tutorial, I went for the easy way. Uh, I was basically telling that those um, uh, those EMG cells were for the extensors, those for the flexors. I um, filtered and averaged, and then I gave the same EMG envelopes for all the extensor muscles and all the flexor muscles. Um, uh, I also I'm, I was also including all the muscles that are just for the hand, but they were given no uh, electrical activity. I'm, just, I'm saying 43 because that model includes 43 actuators. Uh, I'm not an expert on the four arms, so maybe there are more as I actually know. Uh, this is a model that was uh, provided with a, a paper 2018, and there were 43 muscle actuators. Okay, so now I want to go, so that, that is the state of the art. Everyone is doing like this, basically with viper EMGs. Uh, it's nice. We there are multiple, multiple, multiple applications in sports, clinical uh, applications, rehabilitation, uh, neurophysiology investigations. Like as I said, thousands of papers, and it's working. But we want to go a step, uh, a step uh, forward and improve the state of the art by going one step, uh, one level more detailed into the modeling, because uh, that's what I wanted to represent here. The Viper EMG uh, signal merges everything together. The recruitment dynamics, the firing behavior of the motor neurons, uh, the filtering um, uh, effect of uh, the skin and fat, everything is clipped together and lumped into a single signal. That is useful, but that is 
very difficult to interpret. And because of that, uh, the modeling is very difficult to tune because basically you don't know what you are doing. You're having, you are having a black box. So people have started in 2017 to use high density EMP recordings to transform this pipeline. So the first one I know of was again the group from Sartori in 2017. So they were taking high density EMP recordings, decomposing the high density EMP, getting the spike trains. The spike trains were summed, so I'm here. Then there were summed the spike trains to get the cumulative spike train. And this cumulative spike train was input to a second order differential equation that should be the activation dynamics. That would give you an envelope, an envelope that uh, directly comes from the um, uh, effective intent of the user because this comes from spike trains that were identified. And then this envelope was uh, summed with the EMG residual that was not explained by the spike trains. Bam, we get a single envelope, like before. But this time, it is not a bipolar EMG envelope. It is an envelope that is that comes from residual EMG and this filtered community spike train that was on top of it optimized using an offline calibration. So compared to bipolar EMG, we are actually doing the calibration on something that makes sense, that relies on motor neuron activity. And they showed that the results were improved just compared to bipolar EMG. So that's already a great step forward, especially because they introduced high density EMG signals in neuromuscular modeling. But still, it's it's a bit frustrating because you have those spike trends, you have the individual motor, neuron, motor neuronal activity, and you go back to a lump uh, signal. So how can we go uh, forward with this? As I said, you have all the spike trends. Well, what you want is this. You have each of those spike trains linked with a single motor unit and a model for a single motor unit. And uh, this is the work of my PhD. So I'm going to talk about something uh, I know of now. Uh, so the aim is having not only one heel type neuromuscular model, that is a huge black box for the whole muscle, but actually having a population of those, mo of those um, models. Each of those models would play the role of a single motor unit. Well, on paper, it looks nice, like I have the activity of one motor neuron from uh, experiments, and I will be able to produce some motor unit forces that will sum and create a whole motor force. But the big question is, this, is it actually a good representation of the motor unit form and its behavior? And then, if not, is it working? Well, Yes and no. So to investigate that, uh, with uh, especially uh, Simon, who is not here, who is not here today, but also Aridra in the back, uh, Tiani and uh, Dario, we investigated uh, basically the quality of the high density MG decomposition output based on multiple different grids that would have uh, different size and density. So you remember the uh, high density MG grids from uh, yesterday and the day before. Well, we did not put one, but four uh, on the TA of uh, a subject. And these were basically uh, downsized and um, we reduced the density artificially. And the take home message is that if you increase the electron density in the grid size, tada, you will increase the number of motor units that you can decode. And going to very high levels, we went up to 91 uh, motor units decoded into a single TPLS interior for one subject. That is uh, very high. I, but it makes sense. I mean, you put more electrodes, you go uh, denser. It makes sense that you would get more, uh, more motor units because basically the spatial filtering is getting better and better. But more interesting is that if you go, if you increase the electron density this time, you will also increase the amount of low threshold, tiny motor units that you can decode, those which are recruited very early during, during contraction. And this is very important for um, linking intent to function and neuromuscular modeling. So 
Here is uh, a slide that shows uh, the neural drive that is estimated from the uh, experimental spike trends. So uh, the process is uh, very simple. You get the spike trends, you sum, you filter, a uh, low-pass filter uh, for huts, and uh, that gives you the blue lines, blue dotted lines. And theoretically, they should superimpose with the isometric force stress that is in black. And as you can see, if you increase the electron density, you will have more, relatively more small amount of units that, will, that are recruited early. And you are, you are able to approximate the neural drive, so blue versus black, better and better if you increase electron density. Yet, uh, so here it's very good, but here it's with 256 electrodes on the, on the subject that was very good, and usually you get more these kind of results. And that means that what you get from the spike points only is a neural drive, an estimation of the, of the neural drive that is not good in the uh, low force um, uh, portions of the, of the task, especially here. So that, that's an issue. That's an issue because if you are missing some neural drive, well, that is not working because in the low force um, regions of the force integration, you will be missing a lot of force. So one way to uh, solve that would be going denser and denser again. So this is a two millimeter grid that um, uh, we got recently. And we can see that even if we are going denser and the correlation of the MUAPs between uh, the, the electrodes gets almost to uh, one, well, we'll still get more and more motor units. So we could go denser, but going denser also means going usually smaller. And there is a trade off to find between covering the whole muscle and going very dense. Yeah. Uh, uh, 256. It's uh, 26 by 10. So is it really different from the one you showed us before when you want to control an electrode? Yeah, uh, different in two millimeter in terms of electrode okay. distance and okay. the one before okay. four millimeter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, the black ones were obtained only with eight millimeter uh, electrode distance. So basically we're discarding uh, two channels, keeping one, discarding two, keeping one. Then uh, if you go four millimeter, you add the blue ones. And if you go two millimeter, you add the red ones. And uh, the red ones, you also get the tiniest motor units. Uh, so that's uh, that's very interesting. But going dancer, meaning having very good equipment, uh, is difficult. So another way, and I'm almost finished. Another way is uh, going computational. I have this information. That's nice. I mean, 81 motor neurons is very nice. Usually you get more 30, 40 uh, with very good experiments. But we saw that even with 81, it wasn't perfect because we don't have the whole motor pool and its whole discharge behavior. So, so a way to solve that is to reconstruct the um, motor unit activity of the complete motor unit pool. So going from 81 to the activity of the complete motor unit pool. So to do that very quickly, you can have an estimate of the neural draw, uh, of the common input, of the motor neuron pool. And by doing an offline calibration of some motor neuron models, you can get a distribution across the motor neuron population of some electrophysiological parameters for these models. And once you have this continuous distribution of those parameters, you take a population of models, you assign the parameters, you simulate, you get the um, expected discharge behavior for the complete population. In another what it does usually it basically repopulates uh, the portions of the motor unit pool that are underrepresented, especially the uh, low threshold motor units. So you have one or two uh, small ones for, from experiments and many large, and the computational method will repopulate those uh, populations that are lacking motor neurons. This is working, this has been validated for the neural drive but also for the individual motor units. Uh, it's working but not uh, for very high force con uh, contraction. So it's working up to 40, 50% MVC, not above. Okay, and this is my last slide before concluding. This is how the pipeline that you saw before uh, could be adapted 
now for high density EMG. So that comes from uh, a preprint that we submitted a few weeks ago. And I mean, the concept is quite the same. We have EMG, so not micro EMG, but this time high density EMG. We have individual spike trains that could be reconstructed to the completely um, reconstructed motomy pool. And this time, rather than merging all of those spike train into a unique signal that was done in 2017, well, we'll keep them at, at this as it is because they include the firing rate of the individual motor neurons, but also the discharge, uh, the recruitment behavior. Like this one is recruited before this one, before this one, etc. So intrinsically, it's there. So these, these motor neuron spike trains are input to a muscle model that is slightly different than before, rather than just having a, a unique hint type model, would have a population of hint type model. <coughs> this again is coupled with a musculoskeletal model to get some architecture, but also some parameters that are scaled. And then you get the motor unit forces, and finally, the muscle force by just summing the motor unit forces. So this year, um, is basically, it's, it's the first time that uh, we managed to have uh, predictions of muscle forces with a motor unit resolution and in human voluntary muscle contraction. So basically based on high density MG, based on motor neuron data. <laughs> so it's uh, a motor neuron driven muscle model. Uh, so yeah, and you can get cool things. For example, here in, uh, in purple is the muscle, motor unit activation. For a single motor unit, you would have these for all the motor units, the muscle. And this here in red is the distribution across the motor unit wall of uh, the motor unit forces during contraction. So yeah, you can basically uh, dictate what's happening in the muscle at the motor unit level now. So a nice application that goes really from intent, so spike trains, to actually function, so musculoskeletal modeling, is that rather than having just a single actuator, rectilinear actuator, we can build a volumetric uh, muscle that is um, controlled at the level of the individual motor units. And here during the ramp of contraction, you could see uh, the motor units getting activated one after the other, so from blue to red. So this is some ongoing work. We hope to be able to um, uh, match those identified motor neurons to the volume, uh, the muscle volume. Not an easy task, but it's uh, it's some work. And to conclude, another application, of course, for today is controlling prosthesis. So for now, um, most prosthesis are controlled with bipolar EMGs, and uh, Jumper is going to talk at length about that. Uh, but the aim later. Uh, for example, in the project ERC Bionics, which is also one of the projects in the lab, is to control neuroprosthetics with uh, individual motor neurons that were sectioned uh, in, uh, in MQTs. And this kind of works by uh, doing neuromusculoskeletal models with motor unit, motor unit resolution could help in uh, controlling processes. Uh, uh, yeah, so to conclude, today we went from intent to function by first going inverse. So we have motion, okay, how can we go back to motor control? And then going forward, so from myoelectric activity with a, a state of the art uh, techniques using bipolar EMGs, and now uh, new avenues using high density EMG uh, and individual spectrums. <laughs>